the one and only Mr. Sean Davari, formerly Sheik Abdul Bashir in TNA Wrestling. It's great to have you on the line, Sean. Hey guys, how y'all doing? We're doing great, doing and great. Uh, obviously the big topic of the week. We're all talking about what happened on Monday night, and I've got to ask you, which did you choose to watch this past Monday night? Well, I watch everything. Like, I mean, it, it's kind of when you work within the industry, you kind of keep uh, your eye on everything that's going on. Like, in a given week on my TiVo, I record Raw, SmackDown, Impact, uh, Ring of Honor Wrestling. I get some AAA stuff from Gala Vision. Uh, I get some. Uh, I get some other uh, independent Mexican wrestling company so I, I record everything and I watch it all so if you if you have any questions about what happened on Monday night or on Saturday morning at 3am and AAA wrestling if you ask me I could probably tell you <laughs> well that's very cool so what did you think of uh, the mm-hmm. end result of Monday night was it as epic of a night as uh, us wrestling community was hoping for yeah I mean for, for different reasons I mean you can, artistically it's going to mean different things to different people or like what they saw as far as a creative thing but I mean it's, it's, I said it's always going to be a big thing when lose uh, for for either company because they're going to get to get some uh, finer statistics as far as what their audience is, is tuning into and what you know for example they're tuning out of when when Raw is not head to head with another wrestling show and they see a dip in ratings it's really hard to tell uh, where the audience is going because there's so many other programs going on but you know when like Nitro and Raw were going head to head and you would see in a specific quarter hour, you know, 800,000 viewers leave Nitro and, and Raw gain 750,000 viewers, it's pretty safe to say that the audience is, is changing channels to see something else. So that's, that's the part that's, that's, you know, most interesting to me is to see how the, you know, time slots fare head to head and if the audience were dedicated, you know, if, if we saw a specific number of fans tune out from Raw or SmackDown, would that, equate into a spike in the competition's programming, or would that mean they were tuning out to watch, you know, CSI or, or something different? And that's- yeah, we've actually had this discussion on the show before about how uh, it's so different from what it was a decade ago, because there are a lot more options uh, for television shows and not just wrestling. Yeah, a lot more options, and like something that, um, you know, like I said, with, with direct comparison of two comparable products, it, it's really easy to gauge what's going on uh as far as fan viewership, I know like a lot of times people would report or write about, you know, quarter hour breakdowns for specific programming and saying, oh, so and so gained this many viewers or so and so lost this many viewers. But without having another comparable product, another wrestling product out there, it's kind of a moot point or a, a poor statistic because a gain in numbers could just mean that the NBA went to a commercial break. So people just start channel surfing and they landed on whatever programming or, like I said, a number lost doesn't necessarily, like, for example, if, if I'm on TV on Monday Night Raw and 300,000 viewers tune away, like, it doesn't necessarily mean that I've lost those viewers. Maybe NFL just came on a commercial break and people switched back to it. So having two wrestling products go head-to-head could be a lot easier to gauge uh, where the audience is coming in and where they're going as it relates to one product to another more directly. You know what I liked about the ratings report, though, that I've seen so far? is that WWE didn't slip in the ratings. You know, it wasn't like, oh, WWE gets a 3.5, you know, traditionally. And they went down to, because TNA got a 1.5, they went down to a 2.0. They didn't. There was obviously two audiences, both dedicated to their programming, both tuning in on the same night to watch wrestling. And there was a shift in the ratings. But I think that this is what we've needed. Because for the longest time, in 2001, It wasn't just the loss of the WCW and the ECW brands. I think those fans actually just stopped watching wrestling. Because if you look at the ratings, if you look at the ratings, it didn't look like, you know, if you added the two ratings, WWE should have been getting a 10. And in reality, the ratings started to dip. Right. No, absolutely, crap. I mean, it would would be ridiculous to say that WCW didn't have its own audience or ECW didn't have its own audience. But, you know, but like you said, this this is going to be a really cool time. Uh, I mean, I guess it's kind of one and done with, but like in the future, like I said, if, if two programs go head to head, be it Impact and Raw or Impact and SmackDown and stuff, like it's, it's going to be really cool. You're, you're going to have a lot more statistic tools to compare what is working in your product and what isn't working as it directly relates to wrestling on television. I would agree. So in, yeah, and now in your honest opinion, we've already talked about it a little bit here on the show, but which show did you think was better? 
You know, they both have their ups and downs. I thought the, uh, but you know, the, the thing, and it, it, it depends on. And this was something I actually just talked to some friends that work at WWE, and you know, even some friends that work at TNA that we kind of chit chatted about this over the phone. Is uh, I'm probably not the target demographic uh, for. I don't know if I can say for either show, but like, like right now, you know, seeing Hogan and the NWO and everything, like her, you know, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and stuff in the ring together, it's very interesting to me because at the peak of me being a wrestling fan, that stuff was red hot. And on the same side, with uh, Bret Hart and Vince on the show, again, that was like when I was 12, 13, 14 years old was when I was the most interested in wrestling, and that was right around. 1996, 97, 98. So, like, for me, it was very interesting to see both because, you know, I'm, I'm right. Uh, that that was something that I, you know, watch anyone that's, you know, in the ballpark of 24 to 28 years old. That's kind of very interesting to them. But I, I'm more curious as to if you're, like, a 13-year-old boy who 12 years ago when Bret Hart and Vince or Bret Hart was last seen on Raw was only one year old and in diapers, if that was at all interesting to them. Or on the flip side, if you're on the older end of the spectrum, if you were 25 years old when, when you know, NWO was going on and Bret Hart was on Raw, and now today you're 35, 36, 37 years old, if that's appealing to you at all. That, that's, my, that's where I'm more curious. I'm obviously, the, the, the people younger than me and the people older than me, what they saw of this, the show, which should mean much more to the companies because, like I said, people in, in my age ballpark, they've, They've either been a viewer or they currently are a viewer. So, you know, if the name of the game is to bring in new viewers or bring in people that aren't watching anymore, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see what they thought of that. I would agree. And, you know, I'm just a little older than you. I'm 28, and I fall right into that that, that age demographic that you were talking about because in the height of the NWO, everybody, and this I grew up right outside of New York City, which would show you that, you know, we were in the heart of WWF country at the time. Everybody had an NWO shirt. And it was the most right. popular thing in the world. And realistically, what I'm seeing, and this is based on, you know, Facebook and all that, is friends that haven't watched it in years were interested because the top stories were there. You had the Hogan in there with members of the NWO. And obviously, they can't call themselves the NWO, but they can skate copyrights on the music and all that. Um and they had the Bret Hart and the, the Montreal Screwjob and all the key players from it in, in the ring on the other show. And, you know, maybe it's dangerous that we're talking about the same guys 12 years later. Then again, you know. Well, like I said, it, it, dep- it, just, like I said, it depends on who they're trying to target today. Uh, like I, I'd say on the flip side of that, I'm, I'm curious. People, like you said, uh, you know, I'm 25, you're 28. I want to know people around 1997 who are 25, 28 years old, who today are 37 and 40 years old, What if they watched it, what they thought of it. Like, I wonder if, they, if they've grown to an age where that's no longer interesting to them. And again, people younger than us, people today who are 14, 15 years old, who are spending tons of money on T-shirts and posters and DVDs and whatnot, if the money-spending demographic today, you know, who was just in diapers when that was going on, if this is interesting to them. Exactly. Those are the, the audiences I really think that are going to be able to, to you know, dictate or dedicate, you know, how the next few years of wrestling are going to go. That's why I think WWE is kind of doing a smart thing with this more uh, child-friendly programming because if you know if they get them hook, line, and sinker when they're young today in 2010, that probably means by 2020, 2025, they can still count on them to be spending money on their product. No, I agree, and that, that's a very intelligent look at it. And now you've worked for both companies, and you just departed from TNA, and I guess the obvious question we have to ask you is, what led your, to you leaving TNA? Well, I mean, it was a couple, it was like various factors, but, you know, the, the main one was just, uh, I, I didn't feel like I was being used properly or the way that, I mean, but, I mean it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it was, but, we came to an agreement this summer of, you know, a direction that I was going to be going, like, around June or July. I, did a new con- I came in on a one-year agreement. I came in June of, like, 2008, I want to say. And then that June of 2009, my one-year agreement was up. It was time to do my new one-year agreement. Certain things were explained to me. This is where we're going to go. This is the direction we're going. 
and it all sounded good. And, and then I, I signed on for another year. And then now we're like three, four, five months into it, and everything is changing within the company. Uh, and like I said, when, when things change, it seemed like I, I wasn't either part of the plan or the things I was figured into was not kind of the same things that, uh, you know, were kind of relayed to me in June that, you know, this is the direction we're going. It's so we're going in a completely different direction. So it just kind of led to a thing where it didn't make much sense for them to, you know, have me on the show or, or for me to continue being on their show. So it's kind of like a, you know, let's just, before things get bad for either party, because I, I was driving people crazy there all the time. I was a very, I'm a very good talent, but not a good employee. And, uh, hmm. and you know, it was kind of one of those things that said, well, let's just cut our losses now and then, you know, reassess it down the road. And then, you know, maybe if it, if it makes sense, if, if their infrastructure changes or if their current infrastructure can figure out a way to make me be a crucial part of it, vice versa, maybe we can do business again in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, you said you were a good talent but not a good employee. In, in what aspect? <laughs> I say that because I just bother the shit out of people. Like, uh, a lot of times uh, the uh, general rule in, in wrestling is just kind of show up and do as you're told. And, and like I said, at the end of the day, I've, I've, never, I've never not done what a promoter has asked me to, but if there's something I disagree with, it, I, I, I will be vocal about it and say, I don't like this, I don't want to do this. Here's what I think we should do instead. And then and they say either, yeah, let's do it your way or no, we're going to do it my way, and then that's what happens. But like I said, sometimes people don't even like the, the headache or the hassle of seeing both ends of the, or, you know, both sides of the spectrum. Now, that's a double-edged sword because we had Lance Cade on about, uh, actually, it was a little over a year ago, and he said that the thing he took the longest to realize was at some point you have to do, you do have to speak up because at some point you just have to stop being glad to be there. You have to start oh, right. yeah. that, that's, that I mean, I've, I've always been like that, and, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, people know me for it, and some people... Depending on, depending on your perspective on how wrestling should be, some people really like me because of it, and they feel they can get an honest answer for me. And some people hate it because they just want to have their day be as easy as possible. And if me harassing them doesn't make their day very easy, sometimes they don't like to deal with it. But, no, I absolutely agree. I think, I mean, everyone, to some degree, I'll give you an example. If you're the writer of a show and you have two hours of programming and 60 different talent you need to think about, it's very hard to dedicate very much focus and attention to any one guy. But if I'm me, Sean Devari, and I only have to worry about myself, not the other 59 guys, and I only have to worry about the six minutes that I'm on TV and not the other, you know, two hours and, and 44 minutes, I can promise you I could put a lot more focus and attention into it and come up with something that would work relatively well. And the only... But the difference between my idea and your idea is if you want to take the time to listen to it and then come up with a conclusion of whose idea you like better. You know, Jeff Jarrett was great at that. I mean, he was the busiest guy at the shows all the time. And I, any time I had something to say or wanted to ask him, I'd be like, hey, Jeff, do you got a second? And he'd say, yeah, sure. And we'd sit and we'd, I'd say what I was thinking I'd like to do, and he would legitimately mull it over, and then he'd come up with a, yeah, let's do it your way, or no, let's do it my way. And whichever one... You know, we wanted to do, you know, I, I was, he's my employer. I'm contractually obligated to do what he wants to do. But I always thought it was very cool of him to listen to both sides of the spectrum and, and, and uh, you know, legitimately mull it over and not just kind of baby face you, hear your thing, and say, I'll just do it my way. Uh, now, do you feel well, that you have that you mentioned... to... Sorry, Pat, go ahead. I was just going to say, you just mentioned Jeff Jarrett. Um, now, you were still with TNA during that whole period where he was, quote, sent home and he was gone for a few months. What was that period like, and was it as crazy as it seemed when it, everything leaked on the Internet? I I never, I never like, even really noticed. Like, it didn't make a, a super... Like, the, the only way, like, it affected me personally was, you know, like I said, whenever I had an issue with something I needed to talk about, he was the guy I went to. Uh, after he wasn't there anymore, I never really knew who I had to talk to to get, you know, stuff done. But, but no, I mean, like, it, it never affected me. It was never, you know... I don't think anyone... Unless, you know, I wasn't even, like, necessarily even, like, really in the... Uh, I was working with him on TV. You know, we worked together on everything because he was kind of running the show. But, but like, it didn't affect me. I don't think it really affected anyone else except for, you know... I think the only person that really affected was Mick Foley because they were in a program together on TV. And then the program just kind of got Kate Bosch. But as far as, like, I don't think it affected anybody, you know, positively or negatively. It was kind of indifferent. It was kind of like, you know... Hey, Jeff's not here anymore. Okay, you know, this is a new guy in charge, or these are the new people in charge, and just kind of went with that. 
Yeah, that's interesting you say that because a lot of people were, after Monday night, are comparing TNA to WCW, and what you just said sounded awfully similar to what people that worked in WCW would say, that, you know, I worked there for five years and I had four different bosses. Do you feel that TNA is in that kind of disarray, or is it a completely different environment? Well, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't talk about it right now because, like I said, I, I was done about two or three weeks ago, so I don't know how things are different now that Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff and everybody's a part of it. But uh, um, like what, when I like when I started there, like for me personally, you know, different people have different ways of going about things. But for me personally, if I ever just had an issue or anything I wanted to talk about or check on, I would just go to Jeff. And then when he wasn't, uh, when he was sent home and he wasn't part of the, you know, the at TNA or at the actual like TV tapings or house shows and stuff. It was like some things I would go to about to Terry Taylor, some things I'd go to Vince Russo, some things I'd go to Jim Cornette, some things I'd go to, you know, Dutch Mantel. And then, like, you know, one week uh, Jim Cornette and, and Dutch Mantel are there. And then, then one week Dutch is gone and Ed Ferrara is there. And then I talk to Ed Ferrara. And then, like, a week later Cornette's gone. And, and you know, we have, like, D'Lo Brown. And then I'd go talk to Road Dog about something. And the next week Road Dog would be gone. So it's like I really never knew – exactly where to go. It's probably the closest thing I would talk to Terry Taylor because, you know, he's, he's almost like a mentor to me. Like, he's a really, I, I mean, he was a good friend of mine and I totally respect his uh, wrestling brain. So, like, he would just be the guy I would go to most of the times and he, I just kind of let him siphon or filter me. Like, you know, if you want to take care of this, you need to talk to that guy. If you need to take care of this, go talk to that guy. Now, I wanted to ask you, comparing your input from WWE and TNA, would you say that you had the same kind of availability to go to somebody and talk to them in WWE, or was it very much, you know, this is the way we're going to do it? At WWE, I mean, a lot of times, they, you know, they wouldn't listen to you, but, I mean, not listen to you, they wouldn't use your idea, but, I mean, I've never, I've never, and, and believe me, like, the stuff I was doing at WWE wasn't even that important towards the tail end, but I never went up to Vince and been like, hey, can I talk to you and have him blow me off, or even Stephanie, I never... Said, hey Stephanie, I have an idea. And she'd say, Oh, I'm busy. I can't hear it right now. You know, she would. If she was busy, she'd just say, Email me, and I'll get back to you. And I would email her, and literally within 45 minutes to an hour, she'd get back to me. So I always felt, you know, it kind of seemed like the, the lower people were on the totem pole, like at WWE, the bigger they try to act. There's a lot of people that were, you know, writers that were there for like a week or two, and they'd get fired or quit or something, and they'd be the ones that kind of blow you off. But the people that have been there the longest, like Michael Hayes and and, you know, like Stephanie and Vince and stuff, or even like talent like Triple H and John Cena and Undertaker and stuff. Anytime I ever wanted to chat with them or get their opinion on something or ask them something, they always seem to be, you know, sort of pretty open ears and easy to approach. Interesting, interesting. Now, I wanted to ask you about your name. Uh, yeah. Sean Devari is your name. Yes. When you went to TNA, the clear thing to me would be, you know, people know him as Devari, let's just keep that name going. Instead, they used Sheikh Abdul Bashir. What was the reason for the change? Well, when I started at TNA, I was Davari. Like, I came in there, and we did about a month or two of, of TV stuff where they called me Davari. And then, uh... Was that the World X Cup? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, when I came in, I was Davari. And then, like, um... And there, we were just kind of on, like, a handshake deal just to see if, if I would work out, if they liked me, if they wouldn't like me, if, you know, I was responsible and could make shows and produce and stuff. So... When we were on the handshake deal, they're just like, okay, you know, we'll just call you Davari or whatever, and we went with it. And then uh, when we, uh, when they actually switched and said, hey, we want to sign you to a long-term deal, and they wanted to put me on the contract, I guess, like, when they wanted to put that kind of investment in the town, they wanted to put an investment in the name as well. So it was something that, you know, they said, we can't own Davari because that's, you know, legitimately your last name. So we just want something that we can own which they came up with. Uh, I think Dutch Mantel actually came up with uh, Sheikh Abdul Bashir. And, and more or less, it was just a legal thing so they could copyright it. So I couldn't perform as Sheikh Abdul Bashir anywhere else. Now, uh, did that bother you at all, the, that, you know, they wanted to add a no, name? No, I, I, I didn't care. Like, uh, I, the only thing I could like, as long as, at the time, like when I did that first contract with them, the first year, like 2008, uh, I was cool with it because, they wanted to put some TV time behind me, which which is all I need. Like I said, you know, you can't say that the Dudley Boys are any less successful today because they're called Team 3D. You know, it's, it's you know, you can make whatever you want of anything. They said we want to call you 
Davari and have you be on TV every other week doing much of nothing, or we can call you Sheikh Abdul Bashir and put you on TV every week doing something worthwhile. Believe me, I'd much rather be Sheikh Abdul Bashir. More important than anything is the TV time. Everything else is just filler. Um, you did mention when uh, you know the news that Hulk Hogan was coming in. How do you think that affected the locker room when that happened, and how, how did you feel at the time being under contract to TNA? When they said it, everybody, it was just kind of like a wait and see type thing. I don't think it affected anybody, you know, like I said, positively or negatively, because nobody knew how it was going to play out. I'm sure the guys there uh, that were at TV this past week probably have a lot better idea or understanding of how things are going to be. I don't know. I wasn't there, but like I said, when 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 they talked about him coming in, I was just under like, oh, let's wait and see, see what happens. You know, you you, you never know, especially with like in the wrestling industry, you never you can never trust. You know, don't trust none of what you hear and half of what you see. So it's like, I was, I was just, for me personally, I was like, I'll just wait till it actually gets here and then make an assessment or a judgment then. Now, we were talking before you came on the air about um, your theme song in TNA, and at first it sounded like there was a little bit of some controversy. Uh, apparently when you would come out there at the beginning of the song, it sounded like maybe planes crashing or something, and people were offended by that. Did you notice that? And how real was that controversy, or is that a fabrication of the Internet? No, uh, people told me. I never noticed it, you know, but, like, people told me about it. So, I, and like I said, I've had enough people tell me about it that uh, I'm sure there must be some shred of truth or somewhere that it started and it just snowballed from whatever it was. But, I mean, any time that song played, I, I was, you know, standing in the arena, and I, maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention, but I never, I never heard it or noticed it, so... I guess, what is it that they changed my song, or, or they they had a plane crash in there, or they took one out? They took it. Like, apparently, Patrick knows a little better than me, Pat. Yeah, apparently, in the first version of the song, there's like a sound of it's either a bomb going off or it's a plane crashing, and nobody could really tell what it was. And so, obviously, they went for the more offensive one, which was a plane crashing. And uh, in later versions of the song, they cut that part out. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I, I know there's like a a explosion esque sound like when, when my my eye was sounds like a bass drum, it's like a big bang and then because when I don't know if you like if you ever pay attention to the show when the when my music starts they, they kill the lights and I always thought that percussion sound or that big bang was the Iggy that killed the lights in the building and that's that's what I always thought. I never really thought too much of it. Maybe maybe somebody did intentionally do that. I don't know. How does it feel to be such a controversial character? Because in the WWE uh you know, you and Muhammad Hassan made a few headlines a couple of times, and obviously there's the whole thing with your theme music in TNA. Uh, do you like getting that kind of controversy surrounding your character, or, or does it get annoying? Oh, no, I mean, it's never it's annoying, but, like, I think as long as it generates interest, that's all that matters. I, I'd rather I'd rather generate some sort of buzz or interest among viewers or, you know, wrestling fans or just casual TV viewers. Or, or create some buzz amongst them. And usually they kind of stay tuned in, which is kind of, you know, a big deal to me. I always like to feel that whatever it is that I'm doing is, is somewhat memorable or, or, you know, it doesn't just blend in with the rest of the two hours of programming. So, you know, I don't see it in a good way or a bad way. Absolutely. Now, do you feel two reasons, two questions I want to ask. Uh, there, there's two distinct characteristics about you. Uh, you're you're not the tallest guy in the world, especially in the land of the giants that could be the WWE. And obviously, you're you're Arab heritage. Uh, do yeah. you feel that you're typecast by either of these? Um, I mean, so far, yeah, but I, it's kind of like for me, I found something that works for right now. So, like, it's always you always want to exploit something until the fans are sick of it, and then when the fans are sick of it, then it's time to change. And then hopefully you can change to something that they're into again. Uh, yeah, you're probably right as typecast. I mean, like, if, if you think about it, WWE was the first, you know, nationwide, uh, you know, I should say worldwide, you know, wrestling exposure I ever got. Mm-hmm. And, and we never did so much with me there where it got, like, oversaturated, overkilled, and people were just kind of sick and tired of seeing it. So, you know, it, I never really felt like it ran its entire course there. And then, of course, when I came to TNA, they wanted to kind of, you know, run off of that momentum I had off WWE, and we did the same thing again. And again, at TNA, I think it kind of, you know, my course at TNA ran out before, like, TNA got done with me before the TNA audience 
got done with me. So it's like, even there, I don't feel like it even fully ran its course. So it's like, there's a, there's a point in time where you can do a shtick for so long when the fans start to get sick of it and then it's time to reinvent yourself. But I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a good thing that so far uh, the fans haven't got sick of my shtick yet. And I think I really need uh, to put my feet somewhere for a couple of years and, and do the same thing over and over until I can start to sense that they're getting sick of it. Then, then there'll be time to change. And, and if that change doesn't work, then you know you can tell if you're like typecast or something. Yeah. Are you surprised by the success of Evan Bourne because of his size in WWE? No, I mean, WWE is easy. It's really, really easy to get over if you're different. And, and he is different. He's smaller. He's younger. He's not, like, big and jacked and smaller in height. I meant, and, and, like, smaller in physique as well. He's not big and jacked up. And he doesn't wrestle like anybody else. So, like, everything about him is different than your typical wrestler. Your typical wrestler is tall. You're Typical wrestler is jacked up, and your typical wrestler, you know, just does basic wrestling stuff. They don't do any of the high flying stuff that Evan does, or as spectacular as he does it. So, you know, if, if you can if you can be different, it's super easy to get over there because the fans see so much of the same. They want an opportunity to do something different. Now, that was like a when I my first year in WWE, me and CM Punk were you know we're good friends. We did a lot of independent stuff together before. I made it to WWE, and he made it there, and, and he had an offer at one time. He had an offer to go straight to TNA TV when Samoa Joe did, or he had a developmental offer from WWE, and he kind of asked me what, he, what I thought he should do, and I told him, take the developmental offer because you're different. Like, you're not going to not gonna blend in with everybody else. You know, you have tattoos up and down your arms. You're athletic, but you're not jacked up. You know, you have long hair with, you know, 10 different colors on it and stuff, and you have the straightest thing, you have a piercing in your lip and a hundred earrings in your ears, like, you're different. Like, you don't look like every other WWE guy, so go there and you're going to get over. I, I, I know you will. And, you know, like I said, it worked out. And there's tons of people that, a lot of good wrestlers out there that are spinning their wheels, you know, pretty much their whole careers because they don't understand that just a good wrestler is a dime a dozen. You need one thing that makes it different, and if you have two things, you're golden. Absolutely. I'll be honest. I thought CM Punk was the best thing, the best act they had last year. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do. I mean, it, it's easy. It's easy when you give them something to work with. If, if you show up and you're like, my name is Bob. I'm a wrestler, and you have a short haircut and good physique, and you're tall, and you wear black trunks and black boots. Like, it, it's really going to be hard for them to say, okay, what makes you different than uh, Cody Rhodes, what makes you different than Triple H, what makes you different than anyone else and like chances are they're not nearly as talented so if, if you're not nearly as talented as those guys are, it's really going to be hard to, to set yourself uh, different than the rest of them Absolutely Absolutely, well saying this now, you've worked in WWE you've worked in TNA and it sounds like you left the door pretty well open for both companies, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I, I hope so, you hope seems so. like it <laughs> feels like it so since you feel you did that, you know, what does the future hold for you? What is your next step? Uh, well, immediately on my radar, I got some stuff coming up, you know, just independence around the States, and I'll probably start wrestling with uh, Ring of Honor in February and just doing their shows uh, as it permits. And then, like, you know, my, my next, like, immediate full-time goal is I'd really like to get my foot in the door in Mexico. You know, I feel like I put in some time in uh, Japan and made some good relationships over there. I put in time with WWE and made good contacts there. I put some time out with TNA and made some good contacts there. I really haven't shown. I, I never wrestled in Mexico outside of for uh, WWE when we did shows in Mexico. So I'd like to go there for a Mexican promotion and, and you know, try and prove my worth and let people within the industry of Mexico, you know, learn my name and know of me and know what I'm capable of. And then I really think I'm going to set the groundwork for the rest of my career. You know, like I said, I'm 25 now. I've had about 10 years of of wrestling experience. You know, in the last five, I've been fortunate enough to make some good money. I think over the next two to three years, you know, I'll be able to set the pavement for, you know, getting my name out there in the industry in several places, and hopefully by the time I'm 30, I'll never have too difficult of a time acquiring work, you know, anywhere for the rest of my life. A guy like, you know, there's not so many people like that anymore, but like a guy like a, a William Regal or a guy like a, uh, Chris Jericho, for example. Well, I mean, he's such a big star that it doesn't really matter. But like, Regal would be a good example. Or, you know, earlier in their career, uh, Chris Benoit or Eddie Guerrero was a good type that uh, having secure work was good, but it wasn't necessary. If William Regal gets fired tomorrow, I'm sure he could 
find a job like that and be wrestling anywhere in the world at any point in time for a significant income. You know, same with Eddie Guerrero or Chris Benoit. When they left WCW, they didn't know that WWE would be interested in picking them up, but they knew that they had developed enough of a relationship in Mexico and in Japan and stuff that they'd be able to wrestle for the rest of their lives, you know, have a full-time job anywhere they wanted, you know, somewhere at some point should they lose their number one, you know, focus on what they wanted to do. And that, that's really how I feel. Like I said, I've, I can get in some ends with Mexico and then say I'm 30 and I go back to WWE and they're done with me and they fire me and then I go to TNA and they get done with me and they fire me. I still know I can make an income in Mexico or Japan and be at one of those and maybe by the time they get done with me and want to fire me, WWE would be interested again. <laughs> Just run the uh, the vicious cycle, huh? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people. You should, like, I'll give you an example. A guy like a Buff Bagwell, like when he was done with WCW, he really hasn't had a career, you know, and, and it's kind of kind of sad that, you know, there's a lot of people that make a lot of good money in one place and when that, you know, when that well dries up, they have nothing else, but there's some people out there, like a, like I said, a William Regal or even like a Finn Finley would be a good example is if you, if you build enough of a career everywhere in the world, if, if WWE fires him tomorrow, I don't think he'd have any issue whatsoever finding work. Mm-hmm. I hate to ask, ask uh, I hate to close out with just a couple questions here, but we do have a couple from the forums. Uh, do you yeah. mind if I just throw you a couple random questions? Sure. Okay, from Mark Scan, he'd like to know if you have any acting background. No, not really. I mean, like, I mean, I, I should say not at all. I mean, so not really. I guess the only television stuff I've ever done has been wrestling. And also from Mark Scan, I think he's uh, kind of interested in your your ability to cut promos. He'd like to know. Where you learn to have the poise that you do when you cut your promos? Uh, I think a lot of it is just believing what, what you're saying, you know, and not 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 believing it as in like what you say on TV you actually believe to be legitimate, but like, you know, how have have how you think your character would talk. You know, there's a lot of times the promos I'm get, given on paper, you know, from a writer, be it WWE or TNA, like I'll, I'll see what the the point they're trying to get across and the in the paperwork, and then I'll just take that point and put it into my own words, and then it's easier easier for me to talk as Sean Devari than it is to me to talk as, you know, Vince Russo, for example. You know, Vince Russo is a 40-year-old uh, Christian male from New York. Like, how would he know how to talk like a 25-year-old uh, Middle Eastern Muslim from, from you know, Minneapolis? Like, he doesn't. He wouldn't, you know, and, and vice versa. I couldn't, I couldn't write a promo because I'm not a 30-year-old Jewish guy from the suburbs of Illinois. So, like, it's easier to just get a point. You know, they, I would, like I said, I would read their copy and see the point they're trying to get across, and I would take that and put it in my own words, and then it came, it came out very naturally because it was my own dialogue. You know, I have to say this. There was an interview done with Hulk Hogan on a Canadian channel called One on One. I did a one-on-one interview. And what he said was on this interview that when he goes to TNA, which obviously has happened now, the first thing he wants to do is he wants to tell the writers to basically let the guys say what, say things the way that they're going to say them instead of saying, this is how it's going to be said, and you have to read it exactly on our script. I was surprised to hear Hogan say that. Would you feel that you know that is something that TNA already had been doing? Or? Well, yeah, but it happened in WWE, too. It's like uh, they, there's a lot of people that either they're not confident in their own abilities or they're inexperienced or they're afraid to ask or say otherwise, but... You can tell when a guy is handed a script and when he cuts a promo on television, if he's saying words that are coming from him or if he's just reading what's on the piece of paper, unless they're a tremendous actor, which no wrestlers are. So it, it, it's, it's clearly obvious to me, but the, the problem is, like I said, and again, I don't know if it's because of inexperience or no confidence or something, sometimes people's own words are worse than what's given to them on paper. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. It should be, you know those that are qualified to cut their own promos should. And, you know, if, if you're not that, that good of a promo, then it's better to be given one in the script form. I'll tell you, like, Kurt, Kurt Angle loves a script. He does not like to come up with his own material. He doesn't like it. But the plus side of Kurt is he's very good at delivering somebody else's words as, as his own. So if somebody writes for him a script word for word what to say, he can memorize it word for word and recite it as if it's his his own you know thoughts his own his own uh, dialogue. Ah. Whereas I'm, I'm the opposite. I can't do that. If you give me something word for word that I recite for you word for word what you gave me, it's going to come across as phony and bad acting. 
Huh. So, like, it really should be on a case-by-case basis, depending on what the talent is good at or comfortable with. All right. Final two questions for you, because we spent a lot of time with you, and we apologize for taking up so much of your evening. Uh, final two questions. Have you talked to Muhammad Hassan lately? Yeah, I talked to him this morning, actually. <laughs> How's he doing? Oh, cool. Yeah, he's good. He's just, you know, he's doing a couple other projects he's working on, and then uh, just, you know, we, we chit-chat every once in a while, and just coincidentally, we happened to talk this morning. It was, you know, first time in a while we spoke, so... Yeah, he's doing good. He, he like enjoys his life in the private sector outside of wrestling. And the final question is, again, coming from our forums, they'd like to know uh, if you have any one memory that sticks out as the biggest heel pop you ever got in your career. Uh, not, not a specific one. I mean, like, it, it, it's hard. Like, you know, it, people, it's easy for people to remember. And, and again, even, even this stuff is hard to remember, but, like, it's easy for people to remember things that happen because when they see it, it's like, you know, one show on Monday night or Friday night, whenever it is. But, like, we do one show of television a week, but the other four or five days, we're doing, like, live events somewhere in the world. And in between traveling and staying town to town and different towns and different hotels and then driving and doing TV and then flying here and flying there, like, all the days start to run together. And I cannot, I can't even tell you, like, the different towns that I've been to, the towns that have wrestled in, even the guys I've wrestled in, if we had good matches or bad matches or something as, as insignificant as, as a reaction. I could tell, it'd probably be easier to tell you the towns, or not the towns, but the times I've had a poor reaction in, but I can't, I can't remember one standing out more so than the other. I guess, I mean, I've, I've had multiple times people try to come over the rails, like knock me out or something, but that, I mean, I can't tell you if that, where that was or, or what happened or how it, came about or what happened to enrage those people so much that they thought that they should get involved in a fake fight. <laughs> Very <laughs> cool, man. Well, I can't thank you for spending this time. Uh, Pat, Nick, you have anything to say? No, just uh, thank you very much for spending this time with us. This was a very good interview. All right, man. We, we, we loved having you on. And for those who are interested in uh, having Sean Devari come to their independent event, check out WrestleBookings.com. You can shoot us an email. We'll uh, help set that, that up for them. And, uh, again, that's WrestleBookings.com. Uh, we're currently a little bit under revamping of it, but we're going uh, to be taking emails. So come on and submit the emails, and we'd be glad to help you uh, bring Sean Devari to your event. And, Sean, we can't thank you enough, man. We really uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. After that plug at the end, it worked well. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, man. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon, okay? Yep. Have a good night, guys. Night, night. Good night. All right. That was Sean Devari here on the interactive interview on WrestlingEpicenter.com and Blog Talk Radio. Uh, what would you guys think? Great. I thought it was very good. Nice way to kind of come back after our uh, long break from being able to do interviews. So. Yep, it was about almost three months we didn't do one. It's Bob and Pam Allen, Gordon, Son- Gordon Soli's son and, uh, son-in-law and daughter was the last interview that we did, and that was before... Oh, Sorelda was the last one we did. No, Sorelda was followed that one. Uh, it was right before that one, I believe. Okay. If I'm mistaken, somebody correct me, but I believe that Bob and Pam Allen was the last one we did. Okay. I could be wrong. And if I am wrong, I hope somebody does correct me, but I don't think I am. Anyway, uh, so guys, we got to talk about Monday night. I'm going to have to run here in just a sec, but I'll be back with you. Uh, but I guess you guys should start talking about the implications of Monday night's epic wrestling night. Okay, well... Um, obviously, and I know Nick wants to do this, uh, we should start off with the show that actually kicked off the night for us, and that was uh, TNA Impact. Um, I don't think we have time to go through each little segment that happened on both shows, but I would like to say that I thought Impact was very good. Right. Uh, you know, I'm going to agree with you. I'm tr- One of my New Year's resolutions is to somewhat be fair and not be completely biased. Again, you know, and actually, uh, so I mean, uh, it was very, very good, but I will say this. There were points that did really hurt the show. I think the fa- I think uh, the fans said it best during the quote unquote opening match with the chant of this is bullshit. Oh, I, I started going to panic mode. Like, I, I was sitting there watching the show self destruct. That first match was just like, oh my god, this is not what I wanted to happen. I, I actually, I actually dropped the, uh, I had the remote. I was trying to turn up the uh, volume, and when I saw when I saw, tried to hear what they were going to say about homicide, and then I hear the bell ring. And I'm like, okay, they're probably. And then I hear Penn talking. I'm like, 
okay, they're going to try to pull Homicide out of the ring or something. And I hear, this is a no contest. I'm like, holy God damn, what the fuck are they thinking? Now, apparently, uh, James was telling me this earlier, and I don't know what happened, but apparently Homicide was supposed to win the match, and then during the match they discovered that he couldn't climb the cage or something. So that was like an on-the-fly thing. I'm not sure. I mean, that because he obviously couldn't climb the cage. Well, I mean, I don't know. From what I've heard, the problem is it's not climbing the cage that's hard with that match. We're talking uh, for those that don't know what we're talking about. Cause maybe you were watching. Uh, I don't know the link grow between your feet or something. Uh, we they were talking about the steel sign, which is TNA's match is a cage that goes into a dome with a hole in it. And from what I've heard. It's really easy to climb the actual portion of the cage, but it's really hard to get to the actual hole. And that's, yeah. why, guys, that's why they use Kaz. That's why the two previous winners are Kaz and Jay Lethal, who you could argue are probably in the best shape in all the X Division. I think, what, did Redwood won? Yes, he did, just a few months ago. Yeah, so, I mean, it's possible Homicide, who, I mean, he's a pretty good wrestler. He's an X Division-style wrestler, but he also, uh, let's just say, I believe Homicide has... Uh, revitalized several Dunkin' Donut franchises in New York over the course of his career. <laughs> uh, can I say this? Can I say this, please, guys? Sure, sir. If there has ever been a case to be made that we have to put a fence up on the border, Homicide proved that on Monday night. Wait. You mean the border? James, you mean the border in New York City where he was born and raised? I'm re- I was referring to Mexico, but that's just me. I'm uh, being a little bit racist. He's Puerto Rican. He's born in New York, and he's from Puerto Rico. He's Puerto Rican. Uh huh. Okay. So it's just... Puerto Rico. It's Puerto. He... Puerto. Yeah. He's. Of course. Yes. He's. He's. Uh... <laughs> he's Puerto Rican. Looks black, and so much so that Steve Carino once, in joking, in an interview, said, "Happy Kwan's a homicide," and uh, somebody like whispered in his ear, "Like he's not." Huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. I was but, told uh, once, uh, you know, this is true, and you'll find this. It depends on where you are geographically in the country, what brand of Hispanic you are. If you're Hispanic in the in the, in the Southwest, you're Mexican. If you're Hispanic, even if you're born in Mexico, if you're Hispanic and you're in New York, you're Puerto Rican. That's just the way it works. It, it just happens that way. Oh, okay. But it, it right. is seriously. Look it. Look it up. I mean, ask any Hispanic person. Everybody will tell you that. Depending on where they are in the country depends on how people refer to them. It's true. Uh, I, I know a few Hispanic people, so I might have to go ask them. But you uh, ask, them. ask them if they ever been to like Hollywood, and if people just assume they were Mexican. Oh well, I mean, people always just assume all Hispanics are Mexican. So that that's nothing new. Right. We got the Guats. I, I, New Jersey, where I was, I, we had the Guatemalans. They all lived in an abandoned office building. There was like 600 of them in this like small office building. It was, and we all knew it too, but nobody would nobody would want to go like you know, enforce the law or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway, back to uh, Impact. Uh, honestly, I thought right after the Steel Asylum, which was a complete disaster, uh, I was like, oh god, this show's going to be a train wreck. And then right after that, we got Jeff Hardy and Ric Flair almost in back-to-back segments. Right. Uh, Hardy's debut, I thought, was very well done. Uh, just the thing I would have done would have been, uh, ah, boy, I mean, I guess apparently now now this couldn't have happened because Thomas I couldn't climb it, but I would have had, like, the lights go out, and then when he, and then, like, Hardy's standing on top of the cage, and he, and they fight kind of up there, and they almost have to take a big bump or something, but uh, I thought it was a pretty good debut. I think the fact that, uh, you know, Jeff Hardy, who's argue, who in 2009, I think we would all agree, was the top baby face in all of pro wrestling, you know, jumping to TNA, is is a big deal, and it, it's also like that secret shot. We all, I said it a few times. TNA really needed like a, a, an additional surprise, just kind of get keep people talking. Like, oh my God, he's here. Jeff kind of started to be that, and I and uh, so is Ric Flair. I mean, regardless how you feel about Ric Flair, uh, you know there are people that are Ric Flair marks, and will follow every little move that he makes. You you know I, what? And this is going to surprise you, Nick. And I wrote this on my post on the forums that was incredibly long because I couldn't get to sleep that night. I was actually glad to see Flair. Because not only am I glad to see Flair, because if they do use him right, I'll, I'll have no trouble with it. I don't really want to see Flair take a Styles Clash. 
or I think he'd be best served as a manager. It wouldn't be a bad idea, and I mean, maybe have him do a couple occasional matches, similar to what we are assuming they're going to do with Hogan. Mm-hmm. Have him do you know the occasional matches, but I think that if they use him right, he could be a valuable part of the show. And to some degree, I think I don't know why, but I'm coming to terms with the idea that Flair ultimately wants to die in that ring. <laughs> So I have no trouble if that if that's what he wants to do if that's his life stream then fine I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, but I don't want to see it. All. Well, I you know what if Ric Flair died on live television that would probably ratings would probably shoot through the roof as like not? WCW had him have a heart attack. That's right, they did. Eric Bischoff, you have no heart, and he collapsed. I fell on the floor laughing. I thought it was hysterical. It was good for. It was, I, I knew it wasn't real, but I fell on the floor laughing because it was well timed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Flair does add something. I mean, a lot the, the gen, a lot of people do see you know Flair and Hogan as wrestling's equivalent of Ruth and uh, Joe DiMaggio. They're you know arguably the two best. You know them being there and them potentially giving their endorsements to this generation of stars TNA has can be a big deal. Like, you know, and there is a fan base there that has an interest in both. I mean, James, I mean, you're probably the world's biggest Hulk Hogan fan. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you watch TNA more intently lately because, oh, you're interested to see what they're going to do with Hulk Hogan. I'm sure there are Ric Flair fans out there that will hopefully now do that. Now they know he's on TNA, they'll give TNA a chance. And hopefully, if they're going to do what I heard they're going to do, and Nick, you and I are probably going to go round and round on this a little bit, and I'm going to try, guys, I'm going to be out of here at uh, half past the hour. I'm going to be going bye-bye. But you and I are going to probably go round and round on this, because I'm going to, of course, referencing the six-sided ring. Apparently, Hogan and Bischoff are not the biggest fans of the six-sided ring, and I tend to agree with them on that. Now, there's positives and negatives to it. I'll, I'll agree that. But... We have to agree on this together, Nick. By getting rid of the six-sided ring, if they do do that, and I hope they save it for the pay-per-view and the end of the pay-per-view, they blow the damn thing up. Um, I keep hearing rumors that that's what... I thought they were going to do it at the tapings. They didn't do it, apparently. I, I did skim through the spoilers, and I just I skimmed and searched for the word ring to see if there was any mention of the word blow up, explode, or destroy around it, and there wasn't. So. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually read the, what the results were, but I just searched for every every mention of the word ring. Um, and that's the truth, too, by the way. Um, one thing that you and I will agree on, Nick, is that by getting rid of that six-sided ring, those haters that have been saying that they won't watch TNA just because there is a six-sided ring will now have no excuse. And that's a lame excuse to not watch the show. I, I've Thanks. said it a million Thanks. times. I think those are the same people then that will then go, well, I won't watch TNA because they have a tunnel. Who the hell wants to watch wrestlers come out of a tunnel? But oh, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. You know what? I've kind of now come to maybe uh, the school of thought of, you know what? If the six-sided ring is getting so many, is causing such a big backlash, maybe they should just get rid of it, because, if nothing else, because at least you can, at least you can somewhat shut the backlash for a week. So I'm kind of coming around to that that camp, but I still think they should keep it. But I'm I'm moving camps a little bit, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I could take or leave it because honestly, once you watch it for a few minutes, you you forget. Um, and that's the truth. But it does take an adaption period every show for me for the first couple of minutes to get used to it. But then once you once you get used to it, you kind of it's like stepping into cold or hot water. And there's a shock involved, but then it goes away. Of course, they, they, of course, then what are they going to do with the six sides of steel? They'll probably go back oh. to a regular cage. That'll look awkward around the ring. I know, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome if they still did it, though. <laughs> Just, like, kept it inside the four-sided ring. Well, they, they, they could extend it to the floor somehow, like, make it like a big, uh, make a uh, TNA match like a big Hell in the Cell or something. Oh, okay. Now, I have to wonder this. Since Hogan and Bischoff are coming in and making all these changes, do you think they'll get rid of lockdown? Because that's, that's an idea I'm not too fond of, to be well, perfectly um, honest. Apparently, the uh, poster for the next, not this, not Genesis, but I believe against all odds, 
week. Mm-hmm. And on it, it is tagged, the road to lockdown begins. And like Hogan, and like Hogan's like in the background, kind of looking over all the wrestlers. And in his glasses, you can actually see the word lockdown. So. Well, I think they'll keep the event. I, what I mean is, will they change it to where it's not an all cage format? Is it going to be an event called Hell in a Cell, and only the main events will be in a Hell in a Cell? Uh, well, I I think this kind of I think the the thing I've been saying for a while it has to kind of still be applied. It's like all we can really do is wait and see. I mean, what we don't really, unfortunately, I you know, unfortunately, none of us really know for sure what got discussed this week, what's being discussed long term. I mean, for all we know, they're making some big, huge plan to put the world title on, you know, Jeff Jarrett, and then Hogan he, Hogan, he will be the main event for the next six years. But, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, and just cross your fingers, and I hope you wind up liking it, I guess. You know what I want to say? We were talking about the haters a minute ago, and one of the haters that I saw posted on, on, on uh, another forum, and I don't really post on other wrestling forums. I just happened to read this because I was curious. And they're like, I didn't like Impact because there was too many old guys on it. Now, that's fine. And that was an okay excuse to not like WCW back in the day. Because, yeah, you had the younger generation on WWE. And you couldn't deny it. Because, realistically, back then, Triple H was a young guy. The Rock. Austin was youngish. You know, you had young guys on there. He was fresh. He wasn't young. Well, he wasn't that old either. I mean, what is he only no, about now? He, yeah, yeah. So, but he I mean, was a fresh act. It was a fresh act, yeah. So that's a legitimate excuse then. Now? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wouldn't want to watch the TNA show because there's too many old guys on it. Instead, I want to watch the, the hip and young spry guys on WWE like, you know, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and Vince McMahon and, and Triple H. I want to watch the youth. Well they, well, they do have the youth. The problem is the youth is named Hornswoggle and Triple H treats them apparently like a puppy dog. <laughs> <laughs> I could have done without that segment. That was terrible. But uh, yeah, uh, I didn't see it, but that's what Eric Clancy, our friend Eric Clancy, told me. He said, apparently now Triple H is training Hornswoggle using uh, dog biscuits. Well, it's kind of like Sheldon and Penny from Big Bang Theory. That's funny as hell. When she, that was a ep- funny episode. You know, I've been watching the end of the second se- season of uh, Big Bang Theory on DVD, and that is a hilarious show. Oh, it is. It's all, I got it for my sister for Christmas, so. Oh, man. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, watching. Back, sorry, go ahead, Nick. Well, I mean, getting back to the older guys, I mean, I I think it's a valid point with TNA. I mean, I'm not that thrilled that the Nasty Boys are apparently going to get a program with someone, and I'm really not that thrilled that, uh, you know, Hall's getting another chance. But, I mean... It's like, at the end of the day, let's look at the ratings. Highest rated segment for TNA Impact. Hulk Hogan's debut with the uh, Outsiders. So, I mean... And that was going right up against the Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels segment. And let me also say this. Can I interject? To all those who wanted to say, just because the press conference didn't get a huge rating a few months ago, ha. (laughs) Yeah, you know what? You can you can probably hog again because you're absolutely you're absolutely right. <laughs> but uh, you know what? Uh, at the you know, oh boy, I started to sound like uh, that Colin Coward idiot. But uh, at the end of the day, the numbers don't lie. And the number was when Hogan was actually there. Many of those same people that have been chanting "Screw Hulk Hogan" at the pay per view a few months ago were popping like the were popping like hell. So you know what? <laughs> then, you know, we now all see the real effect that he has. I mean, he, he does have an effect. There is an energy. Even today, when Hulk Hogan walks into a wrestling ring, and I mean, he was definitely on very well on the mic that night. I think I kind of liked the progression of his character, where to me it came off as he was not, he didn't come out straight to say it, but he basically came off and said, okay, guys, I think I did wrong in WCW in a lot of ways. I'm not going to make those mistakes again. Now I'm going to try to help the young guys here in TNA. And it's a good thing because you you have the morsel of doubt as well in the character. Right. You had the morsel of doubt planted so many different ways. The fact that he was in the ring with all the NWO chums. That's one reason to have that morsel of doubt. And he's of chummy him. with Bischoff. Yeah, with Bischoff. He's chummy with Bischoff, who's just a, traditionally and inherently just an evil character because he's so sparmy. Um, you had, at the end of the segment, 
overseeing all that big, heartfelt speech by Hogan, Sting, looking over it from the rafters, make, giving you that morsel of doubt that maybe Sting doesn't buy it. Um, right. You had that weird segment with Jared, which everybody's bashing, but I thought it actually was very good towards this character building. And the um, and the end segment with, with Mick Foley. There was a lot of good stuff. Right, and, and it, it, the show left me feeling like, oh, there's so many things in place. Where's that going to lead? Where's this going to go? Uh, how's this going to turn out? And it's, it'll be very interesting to see what TNA does moving forward from this. Right, I mean, this was a chapter one situation in a lot of ways. It's like, I, I know there were some people that were probably hoping, oh, this would be the greatest show ever, and all these big moments will happen. You know what? It really honestly needed to be, and what it was was a great beginning to the story to the year 2010 in TNA, you know, and essentially, I guess, the year of Hogan, because I, I've read, I think he said his contracts for a year. It'll be interesting to see now, over the course of this year, how do how does all this wind up? How, how do all these little stories play out? I mean, will, you know, is he, he, you know, it seemed like he was siding with Dixie, you know, during that whole Jarrett segment, you know, he, he basically came out and made a point of saying, hey, look, Jarrett, you drove this company into the ground. She was the one that saved it. So, I mean, it's like, what role will she play? You know, there, there was, there's, a, you know, and that's true. But there's a lot of things that go into that, and and a lot of things that have been mulled over with the course of history, um, well, of how that. that was certainly, WWE had a stooge there, didn't they? They did. I, I used to remember his name, and I asked Jared about it verbatim in the interview that we have, and it's still available if people want to listen to it in the archives. It's a 2003 interview. Let's just show you how long we've been around. And I mentioned the guy's name verbatim to Jared. And I said, you know, word association, I gave it to him. And he said, I can't talk about that. Legally, I can't. Now, that was the gentleman who was basically telling him, oh, you got 79,000 buys, when in reality, they got like 19. So they were spending money like the money was going to be coming in because you don't get that right away from the pay-per-view pay in right. demand. You don't get that right away. Right. And yeah. because that they were spending money they didn't have, it was dangerous. Ooh. And he was, he was a WWE stooge. Yes. Ooh. Allegedly, yes. Right. So, I mean, there – and, uh, you know, for a lot of people that were complaining about, uh, oh, the use of older wrestlers or the, the WCW or WWE stars, I'm not going to give away too many spoilers, but it seemed like in the episode that's now going to be taped and aired next week, like they mixed up the new the, – uh, the, the established guys pretty well with some of the – TNA homegrown. Uh, Daniel's got a segment. Uh, beer money was back on the show. So I mean, it's like it, it, it was. It's not. So it at least looks like at least they're going to use these older guys. Have them work with some of the TNA stars. I mean, we really don't. Once again, I mean, we really don't know everybody's contract length. Uh, I've heard. You know, Jeff Hardy's a great example. I've heard he's only going to be around for a couple of months. You know, so we don't really know how, how well his storyline's going to go. Uh, same with, like, the Nasty Boys. Are they just going to be in there to give some kind of rub to 3D? They're just going to be around there as long as Hulk Hogan lets them hang on his coattails. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. And that, uh, let, me, let me say this. I'm a Nasty Boys fan, and I think that they're one of the better tag teams that doesn't get their due from the late 80s, early 90s. And they were a great tag team, and they were nasty, and they were public enemy before public enemy became this for the short time that they were around, and both of those guys are dead, so I'm not going to speak ill of them. But they were that hardcore tag team that Public Enemy became known for. They really were hardcore before hardcore was around. I know it's kind of become a, a, a tired old saying, but they were. They were smash mouth hardcore brawlers, and they worked well for what they did. But they were good. I thought they were very good in their prime. Just exactly. Old. The problem is that 1996, they seemed like they were already kind of starting to pass their prime there, and that's the last time we saw them on a prime time program was 1996. Um, uh, Knob stuck around and worked and, and ended up, you know, sticking around all the way to the end of, uh, uh, the end of WCW just about. But Sags didn't. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, I, I wasn't sure about that. I, I'm, maybe it wouldn't have bothered me so much if they would have waited a few weeks and then brought them into attack team 3D themselves. And then I thought, oh, you know what, at least they, at least it's another surprise here and there. To me, when you had surprises like Flair, Hardy, even Val Venus to some degree, uh, when you had surprises that you didn't expect, the Nasty Boys just seemed like a, oh, yeah. Well, 
kind of thing to me. Well, I mean, it, it's also just there are a lot of people who I, I don't know, it, and they might know who Nobbs is, but I'm sure there are some people that had no idea who Jerry Sags is. I mean, I'm, that's with all due respect to him, but as you said, it's been 13 years since we've seen Jerry Sags on a major wrestling show. You know, so, I mean, they're, they're, they are a great tag team, you know, but their prime is certainly past. And, you know, Eric Atlantic was kind of talking about this with me a, lot, a couple nights ago. It's like there are better options. There are better people to give time and money to than the Nasty Boys right now. And, I, you know, you kind of have to agree with them. I would tend to agree. Yeah, I think what it is is that, and this goes into some of my problems with Team 3D, specifically Brother Ray, Bubba Ray, whatever his name is, is that they just want to keep pumping into that legacy that they're the, quote, greatest tag team of all time. So they're just trying to feed another, kind of like when they feed it with the New Age Outlaws or the James Gang. And it's like, oh, we're just going to feed them a, quote, legendary tag team just to make it seem like they're the greatest of all time. When I don't think anybody's ever going to lose the game. You notice when everybody, whenever anybody has a problem with Team 3D, it's never with Devon. No, <laughs> Brother Ray's just an asshole. I'm sorry. The guy's a dick. And Devon couldn't be a sweeter guy. He's a cool guy. So it's like, how did that work out? How did, you know, you get this complete asshole douchebag who wants to claim to be the greatest tag team of all time, and then you have Devon who will argue with me that the Legion of Doom, no matter what they do, are better than them? Oh, uh, well... It... Different strokes for different folks, I guess. I mean, but, uh... They are the odd couple. We, we were talking about how TNA is going to get rid of the six-sided ring. You know, they need to make... They, they, you're hoping that they, like, destroy it. I'm like, all they really have to do is have Sags and uh, Brother Ray do a superplex spot. The thing will freaking turn to dust. <laughs> we have a caller... Call, we have and a Fisher. caller calling in from the 403 area code. Caller, are you with us? Yeah, how's it going, fellas? How you doing? Who's this? This is Kyle from Red Deer. Hey, Kyle, how's it going? Not too bad. What you guys been doing? Oh, uh, not talking about Monday night, really? Yeah, right on. That's uh, what I wanted to talk about too. I I like the TNA program. I thought it was pretty decent, but I thought there was a few things that were really, really uh, shoddy on there. Like, uh, I'm curious if you're going to say the same things that I was about to get to. Go ahead. Let's see what you have yeah, to say. Yeah, um, one of the major things was. Um, they squashed Abyss, man. That was brutal. And yeah, they that was weird. Out? Like, why would he they, tap out? He's a, isn't he, like, supposed to enjoy pain and shit? And then, um... Well, they didn't... Hold on, hold on. They did not squash Abyss because he was wrestling one of the few guys who is portrayed as being the most dangerous in TNA. He tapped out and he got to hold out to the choke longer than pretty much anybody else in TNA history. He had a competitive match with Mojo. You cannot say it was a squash because he also got a lot of offense in. So, yeah... Well, it, no, because Abyss... Like, Abyss hit, like, a choke slam and a sidewalk slam, but that was about it. Everything else was Samoa Joe. Right, and also Samoa I mean, Joe's a title contender. Abyss really isn't, so if someone's got to do the job in that situation, it's going to be Abyss. I mean... I would agree. Yeah. I mean, I would have liked to have seen something a little bit more catastrophic happen before he tapped out, but that's just me. And I, th- I don't think the crowd really bought into that match either. It was kind of a... Maybe because it was following such huge names that it kind of suffered because of it, but it seemed like the crowd was a little flat during that one. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I looked at the clock many times during that match going, when are we going to see the next guy debut? Um, also, yeah, I thought the couple of the debuts were really uh, poorly handled. Like, even like the Flair and Hardy debuts, they could have done a whole nother Monday Night Special, like a month down the road for Flair, and built it up like a whole big thing, but then they just put him on there, unadvertised, and he came out, he shook hands with a few people, and it's like, you know, I'm glad he's there. Wow, that's really surprising. But, you know, we could have done a whole nother, you know, there could have been a whole nother special for him alone and for Hardy. You know? I, think what well, were... I agree, but I, I think they were just trying to do what uh, WCW and WWF tried to do during the Attitude Era, and that's shock people and get people talking. It's like, oh, if you miss this show, you miss Ric Flair and Jeff Hardy. And, and those wanted... kind of surprises I think are great. Absolutely. They wanted cell towers to be kicking in and, 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 and uh, Morse code to start going off beep, 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 somewhere all over the place. People telling each other to tune in to Spike TV instead of USA Network. They wanted anybody and everybody who was going to turn on Raw to stay on TNA because you don't know what the hell is going to happen. I mean, that's why they went all out. And I think that if one thing 
came out of that. It's not a sustainable kind of shock factor that they'll get, but they built in so many huge names and, and uh, potential stories that they can go with now that I think that it's – we'll get into it later, but it's now – and then later, I mean like in the next couple of minutes, it's now or never for a Monday yeah. night spot. It's time. One of the other uh, things I uh, wanted to point out there was um, one of the first things Hogan said when he got in the ring was, oh, I've been in the back all day, brother, talking with the talent and everything. And then it's like, well, then where did you go that you needed a police escort back to the ring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that, too. That's a consistency error, and and that that yeah. I, I, I yeah. hate that about I hate that about even WCW to some degree. I didn't like the limos because it was like, why would I want to watch a guy step out of a car? But what, why does he need a police escort anyway? Is there people out there trying to kill him or something? I mean, maybe the better have you been on the either. internet? Some people do. Maybe Linda, maybe that, that, that creepy ass dude who like took a mannequin and left it on his garage door or whatever the hell it was. No, Jim Cornette said, because uh, Jim Cornette absolutely hated the TNA show. He said that if he was still working there, he'd have killed everybody with a shotgun. Yeah, I, I heard that interview today, too, and I laughed hysterically. <laughs> he, he he had a lot of good points. Um, I won't go with him and say the whole show was a complete bullshit or anything. I mean, there was a lot of, I would have liked to have seen more young guys in the matches and stuff and have a little bit more competitive matches. Like, I mean... I have to agree that Hernandez coming out and beating uh, Stevie in like th- 30 seconds there, that was kind of, you know, why do we need, need to see that, you know? I'd rather have exactly. seen Beer Money or somebody else with a little bit of, you know, yeah. with a competitive match. Well, I've got to tell well, you this. And, and I'm going to let you go in just a second here. But um, my biggest beef about Impact, as it was, uh, was the timing of everything. And I don't mean that so-and-so didn't have the right line at the right second because that wasn't an issue. And I don't mean that they didn't bring Hogan out right at the right time because they did. I mean, they brought him out right in time to where you were going to stick with that one instead of flipping on Raw because Hogan was in the ring with members of the NWO. Holy shit, Brett can wait. Let's see what this is. That's what they did. They did a good job of that. And to some degree, it worked in the ratings. Um, My biggest problem was at the end of one segment, Hall and Waltman showed up. They came back to say Hall and Waltman were there. They came back again to say Hall and Waltman were there. Oh, yeah. And, and then Hogan showed up. And it was like, like commercial we get it, guys. We out. get it. They did it. Exactly. They did the same thing with Jarrett. Now, me personally, I started flipping at that point because there was like six commercial breaks in, in 10 seconds. I mean, it was ridiculous. It there was were a lot of commercial breaks. Now, is that a TNA thing or is that a Spike TV thing? I don't know, but I can tell you that the end result – was in a three-hour program that had an overlay. The actual amount of programming time was an hour and twenty-six. It was a two hours and six minutes. Yeah, so, so that means like that fifty-four minutes was commercials, almost a whole hour. That's insane. Well, that's I mean, a little bit too much. Yeah. Wow. I did like the uh, I did like the angle and uh, and. Uh, Styles match. That was a good match. I, th- I think everybody did. That was a phenomenal match. Yeah. My only problem with that match was at, at the end it was a little anticlimactic because he had already done those two moves, but I guess I, I was just looking at it as a sheer, what the hell does he have to do to beat him kind of thing. And that Why did Ric Flair leave before the match was over, too? Like, did he get bored? They're exactly. Bored. Like, <laughs> it was more sense. Maybe he got lost. <laughs> They may, uh, see, see, he doesn't like either guy. He, Hogan came out because they didn't want Hogan and Flair out on the stage at the same time. Well, yeah. hold on. You have to remember, you, you know, this this is not the start of this is not the end of the story. They're not going. They I kind of like how they're using Flair because they're not telling you what he's doing. They're being mysterious. You know what? They didn't even really. So I mean, here's the thing. They can come back the next week and you know maybe have even Hogan say, Rick, what are you doing here? You're not under TNA contract. So, I mean, I, I'm liking that they're not just going to come out and tell you exactly why Ric Flair's there. It's going to make you speculate. You know, right now it looks like he has some uh, admirer, uh, some feelings for AJ. I mean, he went and talked to AJ before the match. He came out during AJ's match. But you know what? Not for all we know, he's, you know, he's part of this whole, uh, you know, mask guy conspiracy to take the title off of AJ. We, we have to wait and see. That's something I really wish, in general, people would give a chance to. They're like, oh, well, they didn't explain exactly word for word why this guy's here. It's like, well, no, they didn't need to explain it word for word, but I mean, 
it would have made more sense if he had waited for the finish of the match to leave. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you might be right. It might have had something to do with Hogan. It might have been just Flair saw what he needed to see. I mean, it might have been a let's look at the wrestler. Does he look? Does AJ look up the ramp and see Flair and then feel the need to impress him? You know what I mean? It might have been that yeah. kind of thing. Who knows? But um, see, Ric Flair doesn't like AJ or Angle because they didn't wrestle Bruiser Brody. Did they? Did they wrestle Pat Roach? Did Did they wrestle Pat O'Connor? He's dead. He's dead too. I mean, that was that was a classic thing. He he tried to use the argument that he used on me uh, in our interview. Um, if Foley was a good wrestler, or if Bret Hart was a good wrestler, with um, with Shane Douglas once on a WCW program. And every time Flair would say a name, you would hear Shane in the background. He didn't have a mic to his mouth. Just say, he's dead. He's dead, too. And I thought it was just a hysterical thing because he was actually shooting down Flair, which I thought was great. Um, I'm not sure if it's on YouTube. I'm sure you probably – everything is on YouTube. So, All right, guys. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let um, our friend off here, but uh, I'm going to be jumping off here in a minute as well. Thanks for calling in. And here's what we're going to do, guys. Um, just a few more minutes to go. Think that uh, why do we wrap up? What do you guys think of overall the um, the impact the night will have on wrestling? Well, already TNA is in serious discussions about possibly making a permanent move to Monday nights uh, based on the good rating that they got. And if that were to happen, I think that's a very good thing. I think the same energy that wrestling had during the Monday Night Wars was recaptured for one night. And I think if TNA makes a move to Monday nights permanently. Hopefully that'll start a wrestling renaissance. Right. Um, I think ultimately the impact is still going to be uh, written because, as Patrick said, right now we're discussing what's going to happen. You know, it, hopefully TNA does get more Monday night shows. And I, I wrote this in a post on the forum, and I uh, have been trying to spread it around. It said I said if TNA competes with WWE, WWE gets better but so does TNA because then they've got to put more pressure on themselves to deliver week after week and stay competitive. So I think that this is very well the night that, you know, the first huge step was taken, but now we got to see where it goes. I mean, I, we're all re-energized, but we, need, we definitely need to follow through. You know, it's like, okay, I'm hooked. What's next? And hopefully what comes next is just as interesting as what we just saw. See, my, yeah, exactly, and I agree entirely. But part of what made Monday night's shows so special is both were live. You didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't have the urge to read it in advance. You didn't know what the hell was going to happen. Nobody knew that Hardy was going to debut. And I specifically stayed away from computers on Monday because I didn't want to be spoiled. So I don't know how much of it was spoiled, but I was very surprised. It was how- said that he was going to be there at the show, but they made it sound like he was going to be in attendance. Like he was going to be a guest at the show or something, or he was going to be backstage shaking hands. Nobody knew he was actually going to be a part of the show. Hmm. See, I was surprised that a lot of things happened that did happen on, on Monday. And I think that without that live feel, it's going to lose a lot of that. And, you know, Nick, we're going to go round and round on this one again. And, you know, you're Mr. TNA, and, and I'm just kind of – I'm re-energized on TNA, and I'm willing to give them more of a chance because the show was such a solid show. Um, but I'll say this. What they need to do now is it's time. It is time. If there's ever been a time when they have the momentum to actually go on Monday night, I'm not talking about competing. I'm talking about just giving people the option. And you know, maybe they will. Maybe they will compete. Maybe they won't. But you know what? At least it would be two wrestling shows to keep our interest. We would give a damn about what shows we we're going to do on Monday night. They might not ever beat WWE in the ratings, but at least we'll damn well care about both shows. And I think that, unfortunately, Bound for Glory... We'll go back and forth on this all the time, but I think that was a sign that what they were doing and the direction they were taking wasn't going to get them there. So what needed to happen was we needed a change, and we got the change. And we'll see now if it leads to the promised land. Well, I think we saw with this first episode, uh, and I'll let you go in a minute, Nick, but uh, I think what we saw here, just with the way the ratings turned out, that uh, TNA can kind of hold its own. It's not... Uh, up to WWE level yet, but they proved that they can go on there on a Monday night and uh, hold their usual audience and then grow their usual audience. So hopefully that trend continues. And when I say compete, I I, 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 gotta, I should clarify this a little bit better. I do not mean, okay, 
WWE got a three, TNA got a three. I, I mean, is based on kind of what they did on Monday night, where they got, well, not only, like I said, they actually exceeded what their usual audience is. I mean, that, that alone is a, a step somewhat in the right direction. I mean, that, that's what I want to see. And I actually will agree with you, James. The, the, the momentum is there. The iron is hot. The cliches are being said. Take the risk. Jump. Try to jump Snake River. And uh, yeah. with, if it's not going to happen now, it's not going to happen at all. Right. So I, you know what? It's, I think Dixie Carter summed it up real well in our in, in that uh, promo sh- well, promo interview address to the of the, the to the locker room she did back when Hogan was signed. It, it is the time to swing for the fences. She's not trying to recreate history. She's trying to make TNA's history. And that, in order to make history, you got to take that bold, bold step. I mean, it will it will either succeed. Spectacular, spectacularly, or it will be an epic failure. But you know what? At least, at least you tried. I mean, mm-hmm. and one last thing, guys, and I'm gonna I'm gonna to jump off, and you guys can finish up. Um, my honest take on this is the most accurate criticism I've seen is also the most accurate statement. And they're saying that they're trying to recreate WCW. Maybe they are, and maybe maybe in the wrong ways, maybe in right ways. But there is no more appropriate blueprint towards both success and failure in the history of wrestling to follow than WCW. It was both the most successful and the most disappointing collapse. And if they can make sure that they don't go towards the collapse part and do use the blueprint for success, then I think we could be talking about a whole different world. And I think if we're doing this 10 years from now and we're talking about the 2010 decade in review like we did a few weeks ago... I think we could be talking about a whole brighter and more happy uh, ten years than we did when we did that one. Yeah, that was that decade was a disaster. But uh, uh, we haven't really talked much about law itself. Uh, we I'll and, tell you, uh, guys, you know, I'm going to jump off, but you guys are welcome to finish up. Okay. Okay. Good night, James. Good night, folks. All right. Um, well, start off raw. I actually do want to say this. I wanted to congratulate Bret Hart. Three months pregnant at his age, that has got to be difficult. What'd you say? I said, Bret Hart being three months pregnant at his age, that's got to be difficult. Oh, shit. <laughs> Snap, boy. What I was going to say about Raw was that um, it had its, some of its usual problems. They had a stupid comedy skit that made no sense. It wasn't funny. Um, they had a boring Divas match that they had the gall to put up against the TNA Knockout Tag Title match, which was far superior. I don't, I don't care which one got the higher rating, because we all knew WWE was going to get the higher rating anyway. But as well, you, your Divas division doesn't compare. I'm sorry, but um, uh, where else? And you know, Sheamus is a boring champion. He's just not cutting it for me. But overall. The show, and and a large part of it was because of Brett. Uh, I, mean, I thought he added a lot of class and just that air of nostalgia and energy to the show that it hadn't had in a long time. Um, I thought this week's Raw was a drastic improvement over what we've been seeing before. And it, I'll go as far to say that it's by far the best Raw I have seen in ages. Well, I mean, I've said this before, and I, I will stand by this statement. What? Just because you have a good week does not mean the ship has been righted. Oh, no, you know? not at all. They've still got a long way to go. They've still right. got things to fix, yeah. And here's the problem. And uh, the gun has been fired. The big draw that they've got, the big, okay, this is the thing they can't do. This is the thing nobody else can give you. The return of Bret Hart has been fired. And you know what? It, it was interesting. It has some energy. But it's like... And it's what we were talking about with TNA. Can they keep that momentum going? I don't have the faith in Vince McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, you know, and anybody else in WWE Creative to understand the storyline and keep it going successfully. I just don't – I just think they'll find a way to bungle it, you know? <laughs> and, I, and you I, know what? Considering what they did with CM Punk last year, it's very easy to believe that. Right. And uh, – the pro- I've already made the point. I feel like, to a certain extent, they've already kind of bungled it because I have no interest in Vince McMahon as a heel anymore. This is the most stale, boring, overused gimmick in all the WWE. We have seen- Vince has been the evil boss now for 12 years. It's like, 
it, we've seen all the tricks. We know what he's going to say. We know how he's going to say it. We know all the little moves. It, and we know, all the, we know what he's going to probably do. Odds are, I would not be surprised if, you know, you know he, oh, he hires security and they escort Brett out of the building. They do all that stuff. It's like, I just don't have the interest in seeing Vince McMahon versus Bret Hart. I would rather, and I've said this before, see a situation where Bret teams with the Hart dynasty against somebody. I mean, actually, you know I, what I would have done? Um, I would have done the Bret and Sean segment to start the show. And I would have done DX and Jarrah show as the main event. And then at the very end, the Hart Dynasty comes out and beats up DX. And Bret Hart stands over DX and, you know, basically turns heel. And that would have been my closer. That's what I would have done. Well, this is just me thinking off the top of my head because one thing you do have to consider with Bret is who is he comfortable working with, you know? And would he be comfortable working with Sean again? Would he be comfortable with Triple H? Probably not. I could, I, you know what, I think we got to have something with, uh, maybe, God, I mean, it was, I know people probably think, oh, that's not what people want to see, but it's like, sometimes what people want to see, they don't really get how bad it can be. I would have maybe done a situation where, you know, Bret Hart comes out at the end of the night, and, you know, Jericho's whining and complaining about being kicked off, and he begs Bret to empower him to come back next week somehow, and, uh, or he begs Bret to make him the guest host, and Bret says no. I would have had Jericho attack him, and then have Big Show come out, you know, br- you know that way. And the hard times can rest out to save Brett because, oh, yeah, it's, oh, yeah, because it's their uncle. It's, you know, the family. They're going to stick up for their family, and maybe you do a situation where Brett takes over and mentors the hard dynasty. And they oh, that would, that would have been interesting, too. And here's the thing. Also, I mean, you know, you can make a point okay, Jericho can't be on Raw anymore, but you know what? <laughs> it would have been interesting. It also would have been a nice side tag team feud, and then maybe, just maybe at the end of it, depending on how it all goes, you know, the Hart Dynasty beat, uh, beat Big Show and Jericho, uh, Big Show and Jericho, and they say, well, you know, now we're the guys that should be contending for those tag team titles. And the press says, yeah, and I showed you guys all the tricks you're going to need to beat Shawn Michaels, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's just, I, I, said before, I just do not think that a Vince McMahon, another Vince McMahon program now 12 years, you know, after uh, him doing the whole Mr. McMahon gimmick is going to work. I just get sick of Vince McMahon on my television. Exactly. All right, and, and I'll be honest, I don't think that, that – I personally don't want to see Brett wrestle. Um, I don't want to, him to risk his health, and I know that he can't wrestle at the level that he was. Because one of the best things that I can say about Bret Hart, even though his career ended prematurely and it ended with an unfortunate concussion and all that stuff, at least I could say Brett, at the time he retired, was just as good in the ring as he ever was. He was still – the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. At 52 years old and following a stroke and, you know, a series of concussions, I don't think he's going to be able to live up to that standard. Not only that, right. not only that, but... Um, what are you doing, back? I, I came back to just say this. It, it came to me that I had to say this. Oh, okay. Okay? It was weird, and if you were negative, you could come out with this line. Monday night was the return of the Muppet and Frankenstein. Hogan walked and talked like Frankenstein, for Christ's sake, and Bret Hart did a segment with Jericho where he turned and faced the camera and looked like Animal from the Muppet. <laughs> That's a little harsh, but okay. I don't know why I wanted to share that, but that was just on my mind. Well, in all fairness to Hogan, he is a fake hip and probably can't bend his knees anymore, so I, I think that's probably the effect. And that's also funny, because didn't his wife call him Frankenstein on that episode where she was teaching him how to dance? I have no idea. All I know is that I have more t-shirts of those two guys than any rock band or wrestler out there, and I have more respect for them than anybody, but I'm just taking shots at them, because if I'm being unbiased and I'm going to be honest and take shots at McMahon and Michaels and all the other guys, I have to take shots at the guys I love, too. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Go back to yours. That's okay. I was actually just finishing up. Uh, what were you going to say, Nick? I think James Walsh has been so sleep deprived the last couple of months. His last bit of sanity has slipped because he basically posted his TNA review quoting lines from Grease, the movie, and now, <laughs> he, comes on here, now he comes on here just so he can say, call, you know, just so he can come on and make a line about uh, Brett, about Brett and uh, Hogan. So, it's like I. I, I, I think that young Alex Walsh, uh, named after James' favorite wrestler in the whole world, Alex Shelley, 
has really uh, driven his bot game with the lack of sleep he's getting. Oh, yeah. But we love James here, our boss. No. Uh, he's our Mr. McMahon. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's just our good nature. That's just my good nature ribbing up James. Kind of like how I rib you. I rib Eric. I mean, I'm trying to have fun. Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I should. I want to say last night, Derek. I want to say congratulations on the Jets making the playoffs. And Patrick, I'm so sorry. Oh God. I'm. Uh, you know what? That was so. They were so bad that I got to a point where I felt like they didn't deserve to make the playoffs. So. Whatever. Well, hey, like like I said, I'm a Rams fan, ladies and gentlemen. So. Oh yeah, that's pretty sad. Of, of course, of course, and this this will go very much so along with uh, our our talk about you know the ratings. It's like with the New York Giants, there were some high expectations, being you know a good team the last couple of years, recent Super Bowl champion. With the St. Louis Rams, it's like we're one of the team. You know what? The team was a, it's been a disaster the last couple of years, so it's not that surprising. Yeah, what do you think of uh, Stagnola as a coach? I I don't know. I mean the the problem is just that. The, the team. The problem is the owner uh, died a number of years ago, uh, and her sons are trying to sell the team. Well, they don't want to sell them until they can get what they think it's worth. And the problem is the economy, like it is, well, they, they're not going to get what you think of a football team for these this day and age. So it's like until that happens, though, the team won't get better. Yeah, it's, it's, I just think it's sad that our defensive coordinator went to go be head coach of a team that already sucks that nobody, I don't think anybody could say that in a year at least. Uh, Bill Parcells would need about five years to fix that team. Um, and we lose our defensive coordinator and he's replaced with an idiot that has a terrible defensive scheme. So both teams suffered. Right, right. Uh, not only did both teams suffer, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah. At least we got the number one pick. Yep. Hooray. And, and <laughs> yeah. So now, oh boy. <laughs> that sounds, but uh, yeah. any other comments you have on Raw? Uh, I mean, this they they gave it a good shot, and you hope that maybe they can somehow find the magic, find the magic somewhere, or do something. But it's like we just have to wait and see. Just like with TNA, we're not sure what's going to happen now. Our good friend Eric Clancy, who I steal a lot from, uh, made a great point. He said, you know what? But this was just a one-time thing. Brett was great partially because, oh, he was just Bret Hart. He wasn't just Bret Hart guest host. However, mm-hmm. next week, we go back to the same format. Next week, Iron Mike Tyson is going to be there. And you know what? It's like, how well does he know the product right now, you know? I know he's been said before, oh, he's a big fan of wrestling, but it's like, how much is he now? I mean, I've, I can't imagine. I mean, the, the Attitude Era was right up his alley. Right. And another thing is, I mean, with Brett, it's kind of like I was joking about Brett's waistline earlier. Most fans will forgive that because it's still Brett Hart. We love him as wrestling fans. So the, the same thing really won't be said for Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson comes out and looks like he's, three months pregnant. I mean, he's, he's going to get made fun of, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, I guess I, I think they'll try and put on a strong show next week too, just cause they're up against UFC and they think because they have Tyson, that'll be the perfect personality to put up against that. Um, but I don't know. I, I I'm kind of with you. Yes. This raw was a drastic improvement over what we've seen before. And it wasn't even that great. It was just, uh, really, it was all the Bret Hart was the heart and soul of that show. Um, and everything else was just kind of, you know, run of the mill. We've seen it before. I mean, Kofi and Orton and uh, Jericho and DX were the last two pay per view matches they had. So I mean, they, they weren't the last December pay per view. So um, yeah, there wasn't really anything besides Brett that was really worth getting excited about. But it was just, I, I, I'm kind of with you. I don't have the faith that they're going to be able to keep that momentum and keep the show going strong. Right. And one thing, I mean that. And it's just that where does, you know, the, will the, there's, no, there's not going to change your writing staff. And that's, that's one of the points I was trying to make in the weeks leading up to this show. It's still Vince McMahon's company. You know, there, there was not a new writer appointed. I mean, 
and that that's just, I think there were a lot of people that thought, oh, Brett's coming back. He'll make the show better because he likes wrestling, and you know he he's got his mind about what 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 wrestling is. It's like, yeah, but he's also not now the writer. And I mean, yeah, the question is, is Brett even going to be there next week? I mean, we that's thing we don't know about Hogan. How often he'll be on TNA, and we don't know how often Brett will be on WWE. I mean, will he be there every week? Is he is he willing to kind of come on the road every week? I mean. Or, you know, will he just kind of be there once a month to try to build his feud? I mean, we really just are going to have to wait and see on so much this week. But you know what? At least we're excited to wait for once. You know, it's like sometimes waiting for Raw feels like we're waiting for our execution, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it is exciting. It's You know, I'm really interested in seeing where TNA goes from here. I'm really interested in seeing where WWE, what you know, what they're able to do after this. Um, I'm actually, I might actually watch Raw next week because, you know, I'm not a big UFC fan, so I, you know, I might tune into Raw and see what they're doing. Right. I mean, so there's a chance now. I mean, maybe the first step was finally taken. One thing that I think we actually should be encouraged about is WWE at least recognized the, the the importance of January 4th. And they made an effort. They pulled, they tried to pull a bag out of the, out of their, uh, a, a rabbit out of the hat with Brett. They at least somewhat realized that they have to be competitive with UFC and they're trying to get someone, you know, who ha- was a big name. The question is now, you know, do, are they going to be able to keep that going? You know, obviously there, there's probably some feeling in WWE of, well, it doesn't matter because TNA is not going to be on next week. But, That's the thing. Um, They'll never admit it. And, you know, I read Internet reports, and, you know, take the Internet with a grain of salt, where they talked about how the writers were making fun of TNA and how, it's oh, we're not really afraid of them. But they obviously were, or else they wouldn't have tried to get Bret Hart on the show. Um, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I actually heard that, and uh, t- once again, it's for what it's worth, but the, I heard that, quote, they, the joke in WWE was, quote, well, we'll just put Maurice on because one, cause our one woman will dominate Anything w, w, TNA does ratings wise, it's like yeah. But once again, it, this goes back. You know, I said it with the, uh, I said it with you know when we're talking about football. Your team went eight and eight. My team went one and fifteen. I would love to be one and fifteen. So it's like you know what, Raw got a three point six, expecting, uh, you know, to get a four. TNA got a one point five, trying to get a, a one. So it's like who who do you think felt better about last night? And TNA, right. I think it, TNA right now, there's some. Champagne course popping, you know, cheers, you know, like we did it all right, you know, this is great. WWE, it's like, oh God, we blew it. We did not take advantage of this major opportunity. And they, they actually scored their highest rating in six months, and there's word that they're not happy with it because they expected a bigger number from Brett. And, and I know from talking with you and Eric and James that we were worried that Bret Hart was going to kill TNA. That was what was going to crush it. And um, if Bret Hart had an impact on the ratings, it wasn't as terrible as we thought. I mean, who knows? If they didn't have Bret Hart on that show, uh, TNA might have gotten a higher rating. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about the haters earlier with TNA. There, uh, I won't say his name. I won't give him much credit. But there was a guy who, in the week leading up to uh, this, this battle, saying, quote, well, T- Bret Hart's going to crush Hulk Hogan. Because Hulk Hogan's a 56-year-old nobody at this point. Who all everyone knows is he's the guy whose son put a, a, a veteran, uh, a veteran in brain, you know, brain dead. I mean, angry internet mark. And it's like, and Bret Hart's a legend. Bret Hart's a real legend. Yada yada yada. Well, today I go back to that particular place, and that guy's going, you know, here's the thing though. Bret Hart really isn't all that mainstream, so obviously Hogan was going to beat him somewhat. I'm like, yeah, pal, you're, you know, you gotta love those internet haters and their crappy logic that changes every five seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, the truth is, and I love Bret Hart. I, I, if I had to pick a favorite wrestler of all time, it would be Bret the Hitman Hart. I, I love that guy so much, and I, I, I'll say it again. I love seeing him on Raw, but I, I'm, you know, I'm not biased enough to think that he's bigger than Hulk Hogan. I mean, no, who is like Austin Rock and Hogan are the top three of all time. If you want to right. look at it in terms of star power, and we don't know ultimately. What, uh, it, here's the thing, it's all subjective. We really are not completely sure who drew what and when. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, Hogan drew the highest rating on TNA, 
But for all we know, that also turned people off, and that's why TNA never got close to that number again throughout the night. If you, ask hmm. what the better, if you ask them what the best part of Impact was this week, it was the main event, the Maxine Angle and AJ. But you know, that got a 1.3 compared to Hogan's 1.7 something. So 1.8, wasn't it? Yeah, 1.88. Yeah, I think it was a 1.8. So, I mean, you never really know ultimately what, what who drew what. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, and Jamari was talking about this, you know, you kind of get a better idea, but it's also got to be somewhat of a weekly thing. It's like, well, okay, every week when Hulk Hogan comes out, teenage ratings jump, you know, this to X, and every week when, you know, suicide comes out, they drop this, like, until you can really see week for week what the trends are, it's like you're never really sure. I mean, we can kind of guess. We have a, I think we have a much better idea in wrestling right now of who's interesting and who's not interesting. But it's like we don't know for sure. I mean, what we really do need is at least a quarterly Monday impact. I mean, that how great would that be if we could just get to that, those once, uh, once every four months we have this again somehow. Right. How awesome would that be? You know, we would That'd be a great step forward. And, uh, there are other steps that TNN needs to take. I would like for them to start doing all their pay-per-views on the road, all of them, all 12, not just three or four, um, and and things like that. And uh, But, yeah, if they could at least – uh, I'm starting to get tongue twisted here. Uh, if they could at least get to a point where they're doing three or four Monday night live shows a year, that would be a huge step forward. I would love – I think made a great point – for TNN to go live every week. I know that it's got to be difficult, and they showed on Monday that there were some technical glitches. There was a, I say this, but there was a point during the, during the ODB terra match, which was the actual winning pinfall, where it cut to a shot of the crowd before the Steel Asylum match. Like, saw a picture of the Steel Asylum up for no reason. There was that mistake. There was a, they came back too soon. You could still hear pens are hyping up the crowd. So, I mean, there are some little glitches there, but I think it's going live again would help allow us to recreate that great moment where, you know what, when we saw Jeff Hardy come out, you know, it was like, oh, my God, what else going to happen? What else going to happen? You know, you're never going to get that on a tape show. I would love no. to see it live at least once every month. I think it would be a great idea. Right. You know. Right. And, and they've, done a, they've done a few live shows before on Thursdays, um, and those shows had a different energy and a special feel to them just because you didn't know what was going to happen. Right, and because, as we said, I mean, Sting wrote this in this little companion book he did for uh, his movie. He wrote yeah, about, actually says, everyone kind of knew you could never recapture the same energy on tape that you could doing a live show. That's why Nitro was live every week. They knew it gave them a huge advantage. Remember, when Nitro first started, ladies and gentlemen, Raw was actually taped three, three out of four, uh, three times out of the month. They would air a live show, and then they'd tape the three, the three remaining shows for the rest of the month that night. And that's what enabled Bischoff to do things like giving away results and other th- little tricks he pulled and little pot shots he took. But it also gave that show that great live energy. And there's just something about when someone goes, and we are live from Orlando, Florida, ladies and gentlemen. He, you know, it just makes it feel like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, well, I mean, well, nobody – it's the same thing with any sports show. Um and I know wrestling isn't, quote-unquote, a real sport, but, you know, would anybody watch a taped football game? Would anybody watch a taped MMA fight? No. It's like, it's just, it's just better when it's live. Right, right. I mean, it just, it's that seat of your pants feeling. It's that same feeling of, okay, you're looking at the door because you don't know who's coming. You know, the Lex Luger thing in nice ninety five would not have had the same impact on a taped show, and, I don't think the Jeff Hardy thing would have had the same impact if they did taped. No, especially in the advent of the internet, where uh, now you know SummerSlam '92 was taped, which I don't know why you would do a taped pay per view. I, I mean, I know they did it because it was international and there was a time zone issue, but uh, um, that pay per view that pay per view was taped, and but that was before the advent of the internet, and I couldn't, you know, I didn't know if it was taped or not. I I didn't have access to the results anyway, so it didn't matter, but. Um, in the advent of the internet, dude, I can find the spoilers easily, no question. Right, I mean, that, it's just so easy, I mean, it's tempting to want to know what's going to happen, but then you're also like, oh god, now I kind of wish you would have played it. Yeah, it's kind of like we're self-destructive in that way. Right, I mean, 
because uh, I mean, I'm the guy that does the majority of the news uh, on the uh, on the new website. It's like you know what? I kind of spoiled the shows for myself several times because I posted that Hardy had arrived at the Impact Zone. I posted, you know, that he was going to be there to begin with. I posted the Rick Flair had been seen in the area. You know, I posted all the spoilers of what was speculated for Raw and different things. And you know, it's like I kind of knew somewhat what was going to happen, and it's like. I kind of wish I didn't have known all that just so I could be on Mark that night, but... Hello? So I mean, that, yeah, hello? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that live feeling, you're never going to recapture anywhere else. So, I do think it would really benefit TNA to go live week to week, or at least on a more regular basis, for some, or else, you know, you're never going to get that hot again. Right. Exactly, exactly, and and I, you know, I was very happy today when I went on the the news board and saw that TNA is in discussions about they're in serious discussions about doing it. And you know, and if they can hold a 1.5 against Raw, now the question is, once football season kicks up again and you got Monday Night Football, how well would they do? Uh, I think that would be interesting because you know Raw's ratings traditionally go down during football season, so I don't know. Right. Uh, well, that's something we're gonna have to wait and see. I do believe that part of uh, Thursday, the shows they've had on Thursday lately, are all tied to you know the the lack of lot uh, of the back college football run and people are following college football a lot. So I mean, it does football will affect it, you know, and that that's actually part of the reason why TNA is not airing a show this Thursday because they don't want to compete with the college football national championship. Right. Right. And I'm actually at work past, so I'm gonna have to go. So I just want to say for everybody. Uh, Thanks for joining us here on the interactive interview. Uh, hope you enjoy the show, and I'll, see, I'll talk to you guys next week. All right. Um, speaking for – thank you, Nick Knoll. Um, speaking for James Walsh, who left us earlier, I am Patrick Kelly, and good night, everybody. See you next week, and hope you all had fun on Monday, because I know I did.
This is Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 Oh, what a rush. Featuring the interactive interview. 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 Oh, yeah. Formerly the Blaze. 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 The Blaze